And Doris? Hi, I'm Doris Ostrander from SUNY Adirondack. I am the coordinator for our teaching and learning collaborative, which is somewhat similar to your center, but we're still building up our capabilities. Okay, and Abby? Abby, if you're speaking, you're muted. If you're not there, you're you're probably not going to respond. <laughs> uh, okay, um, Michelle, we just do a quick round of introductions with names and locations and um, titles or areas or whatever departments. Michelle Bamla, I work for Academic Supports. Okay, uh, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. Tom Ingram. I'm in marketing and management. Catherine? Girl, and I'm a librarian at Penfield. Okay, and Josh? Hi, I'm Josh McCowan. I work with uh, both the Global Studies Program and, and International Education Programs. And Abby? Um, okay, well, let's get started. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about active learning. And actually, first, maybe if um, people could put in the chat what their definition of active learning is, that might be useful. Just to get us started. We got a really simple one, but it would be nice to see what other people think. Just a few words. What what is active learning? Ensuring, ensuring that students are engaged, engaged discussion. Students take responsibility for their learning beyond just listening and taking notes, as opposed to passive learning, which often takes place in lecturing. Anything other than straight lecture could be a form of active learning. But again, this concept of engagement keeps coming up, doing something other than just passively sitting there. Okay. Uh, and that's pretty much the type of thing we have. It's we we do something even simpler. Uh, <laughs> passive learning is when students are quietly listening to lectures, um, and we have learning that includes applying concepts to doing something. To, to yeah, rather than just passively observing, actually doing something without it. I'm kind of out of words too. But um, active learning we just defined as. Students are actively engaged with the course concepts. They're doing something with the concepts. They're not just listening to someone else doing something so that we don't have to have all the words that they're doing some of the work themselves. Um, and active learning activities could range from a few minutes uh, in a class session to a whole class session or multiple breaks within a class session. Um, you know, we often, people often make this distinction between lecture classes and active learning classes, um, but the distinction's never really that clear, that there's really a whole continuum where some classes may have active learning, a flip class might use active learning activities the whole class period. Other classes may have interactive lectures. There aren't very many classes that are purely lectures. Well, in some departments there are, but there aren't too many in general. And there aren't very many where all the class activities is active learning, where some lecture is common in all classes. And one thing that does happen, though, is that student perception of the amount of lecturing and faculty perceptions are often really different. In surveys of classes, um, faculty report that they don't spend that much time lecturing, that they have students doing much of the active work. Um, when students are surveyed, their responses are often different. And in general, students perceive there as being much more lecturing in classes than faculty do. And it's, it'll be, it, it's hard to say who is correct there, but I suspect 
there are many more students observing it than there are faculty. And most faculty believe that active learning is, is better and therefore they may overstate the amount that they actually do. So the reasons for working on active learning is it tends, there's a lot of research suggesting that it can lead to more deep learning. That if students are just passively sitting there, they're not going to learn things as well or remember things as long or acquire as deep of an understanding as if they're actually using the course concepts. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, you know, add that, um, you know, active learning helps them transfer that knowledge from uh, different contexts. And that's ultimately what we want. We want our students to be able to take what they're learning in our classroom, take it to their careers, take it to other courses. And um, active learning is, is one, um, you know, pretty great vehicle for that. It leads to more long-term recall and improved transferability. And there's a lot of research supporting that. Oh, hi, hi Abby. <laughs> Welcome. Um, okay. No worries, Abby. Yeah, I, you've been here in many sessions and, you know, I didn't want to call you out on that. Okay. Um, and there have been times when I haven't been able to participate sometimes <laughs> because I've been on a phone call or someone else has come in the room. There's also a lot of research, though, that, yes. Yes. Uh, we're, all, we're, yeah, we're all multitasking. Um, reducing equity gaps is a really important thing that, you know, we do see some really significant equity gaps there in terms of first gen and continuing generation students. We see it sometimes by gender in STEM fields, for mm -hmm. example, and we see it by, for historically minoritized groups and so forth. And pretty much all of the research suggests that using act active learning improves outcomes for all students but the gains are especially large for those students who are most at risk. So not only does it make all students learn things a bit more deeply and have greater transferability, mm -hmm. it has an even larger effect for those students who are typically left out, who are most likely to be at risk of failure. It also works to improve metacognition because it's really easy to sit in class and have a lecture to come at you where everything may seem to make sense. But you only realize you don't really understand it when you take that first high stakes exam or you work on some sort of problem set and you realize that you can't do any of those things. With active learning, students pick up on that really quickly and they can get feedback really quickly so that they can adjust things before they fall too far behind. Um, and that and improving metacognition also increases the amount of learning. Uh, there's a lot of research on that. In terms of interactive lectures, which is a really common form of instruction. Yeah, so one of, one of the examples that um, I think a lot of faculty kind of when they're dipping their toe into um, active learning techniques use what we call think, pair, share. Um, and it's exactly how it sounds where you pose a question or a prompt to the students. You ask them to take some time to think about their answers, think about their responses. Uh, and that's a really important, you know, piece to this conversation because when students, um, you know, when, when you call the very first student who shoots their hand up, you know, other, um, you know, students might still be formulating exactly what it is they're thinking about. So really building in that time to give everyone that opportunity to, you know, start drawing on their previous experiences, their previous knowledge and, and start making those connections is really important. And then asking them to pair with another student or, um, you know, typically this is done in, in uh, groups of two, ask them to turn to someone near them to then share their responses to each other and then asking them as a group to then report out to the entire class. And it may not be every single pair, every single discussion is getting, um, is sharing out to the class. Cause when you have, um, you know, this is a really great technique that scales to larger lectures as well. Um, but you may not want, you know, a hundred pairs of students all reporting out in, in this way, but you can, you know, then ask them to raise their hands and, and give them the opportunity to then share out to the rest of the class um, their responses. And this is one of the most common forms, as Maggie said, of active learning. But one thing she also emphasizes, don't forget that think part. Give students some time to process things themselves before you ask them to share their, their thoughts with others. And many faculty sometimes skip over that or treat it really as a, 
don't give it the attention that it needs. Mm -hmm. Now, one way of extending this is you could combine it with pawing. We've actually been talking about that the last couple of hours here. <laughs> but um, if you have a large class in particular, it, it's difficult to hear from all your students. But if you do some pawing, which could be combined with the think pair share type of activity, the common practice is to ask students a question, have them respond in a poll after their initial think stage, then have them discuss it with other people, and then have them vote again or you know do a second stage poll where now you get to see more of what everyone is thinking or how well they're understanding concepts and so forth. And that allows you to scale this a little bit more efficiently and to hear from more students. Um, another activity is a memory dump. Yeah, so I, I think I, I've used this a bit at the beginning of class. It certainly can be, you know, at any point that you're bringing up a new topic, but you're asking students to uh, recall everything they know about a particular concept. Um, giving them the time, maybe they're writing it down, maybe they're, um, you know, they're spending, maybe this is part of a think pair share where they're thinking about it, then they're reporting it to another uh, classmate, but um, you're essentially giving them the opportunity to make those connections um, on their previous knowledge to what's going on right now. And activating that prior knowledge makes it easier for them to make connections. But you don't have to do this only at the start of an activity. It can also be used as a way of breaking up a lecture where you might go over some concepts and then ask students just to take a few minutes to write down their thoughts or to think about what you've just said and then to share or to write down what they remember of it and then to share that with the other students around them. So it can be used in many ways it just as a quick form of retrieval practice, either before a new activity or a way of activating that prior knowledge or just as a way of making sure students remain focused and also sharing their ideas and thoughts and reactions. It's a, it's a quick retrieval practice activity, which again is a really effective strategy. Another related strategy is collect. Well, go ahead. Yeah, so um, you know, collaborative uh, note taking. So um, you know, I, I guess I, I've not used this um, as much in, in my classes, but allowing you know students to work together to um, take notes on the course material. So you can do this digitally in like a Google Doc. You can let students all have access to it. They can you can encourage them to create it themselves so that. Um, you know, they're not kind of reinventing the wheel or, um, you know, or things that they might think are important. Um, someone else might highlight some other area of the, of the content that uh, they didn't think about, or they can, you know, really bounce, uh, bounce off of each other's ideas and really leverage that peer collaboration. I'm sure, John, do you have anything else? No, to add? That's, no? Okay. It's, I've never done it myself either, yeah. but you know, if you have, if you have a class where there's a lot of lecture, this is one way of letting students share their work mm -hmm. as they go and their thoughts. And, and there um, are some like nice features in like a Google doc where you can have students ask questions in the margins and, um, you know, so that they can like have a chat function on the side. So there, there are some cool, cool tools to facilitate that. One ex a more extreme form of active learning is a flipped class a flip classroom. And typically with that, you have students do some readings, maybe watch some videos um, before class, and then you might even give them some quizzes on it before class to get through the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy uh, to make sure that students come prepared. Because if you try a flip class and you don't have any way of holding students accountable for the work they're supposed to be doing outside of class, quite often they may not do that, in which case it devolves into, well, a not quite fully flipped class. The basic principle of a flip classroom is that students will do the easy work, the basic lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy outside of class. And then when they come to class, you can focus on the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, where they'll be focusing more on application and synthesis and so forth. Because typically what happens in a standard lecture class is students will sit there and get the basic definitions and basic concepts from a lecture. And then they go outside of class to try to work on some problem sets, some assignments, or maybe the first time they're exposed to any way of trying to apply that is on a test. And then they realize they don't understand it. You know, it, the goal of a flipped classroom is that we provide assistance to students when they need it, when they're dealing with the more challenging activities. So have them do the easy stuff, get the basic definitions and concepts down before class, and then use 
class time to focus on the things that students are more likely to struggle with. And there's a lot of ways of doing it. It could be with collaborative activities. It could be with team-based learning. It could be using clicker questions or polling type techniques. Um, it could be project-based learning. It could be project um, problem-based learning and so forth. But the key is students learn the basic concepts before they come to class or the goal is to make sure they learn the basic concepts before class and then they spend class time on those activities. Yeah, and I'll just add that, um, you know, really making space for the things that you find important in the class session also communicates to the students how important that work is. Um, you know, I think it, it also gives them uh, those opportunities to make mistakes and, you know, have that low risk to um, figuring out some of these problems um, because they're, because everyone is doing it in that moment together. And if anyone has any questions or want to add something, just either type something in chat or just say something. Yeah, throw uh, it out We've there. got a pretty small group here and we're pretty informal. Peer instruction can also be a really useful tool um, and you know, uh, I'm again, sorry, John, could I ask a question? Sure. sure. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, with the group work on problem sets, I always think that's a good idea. Um, the only problem is the size of the group seems to grow and grow until often you just get people copying each other's work without actually doing anything. Uh, in the classroom, I don't think that's much of an issue. Um, but normally I have students do their own work on problem sets and, and they can say, you know, I worked with so and so. And then if the answers are a little too similar, I, you know, basically, you know, let them off easy. Well, um, I how, how do you get around that? If you're I tend to do most of that. In a flip class, the group work on problems that I was thinking about was in class, where you're leveraging some peer instruction along with it. And one way of doing that is with a team-based learning approach or cooperative mm -hmm. groups, where you might even have persistent groups that work together throughout the semester. But typically, you'd only have three to four people in a group. So mm -hmm. and you define those groups early, and then you just maintain them. You don't have to. There may be some active... Right. My, my issue is you, they, they turn in the problem sets. Those are graded usually okay. and uh if you've got a group of three or four but like there's another student who's a friend of one of them and doesn't have anything or didn't do the work and wants to copy it um yeah. then then what do you do well what i do is a mix of things i will do in my in my econometrics class for example one of the things i do is i have some problem sets that they work on in persistent groups but there's other problem sets they or other things that they do individually. For example, the polling questions they do individually, and then again working with others at a second stage. But you know, you can also have some individual exams, some assignments, and things. Um, so you can break it up a little bit. So it's a mix of the two. One one nice activity that I haven't done as much recently as I did pre-COVID, um, because you know we've had so many people being in and out with various things you know, various illnesses, was a two-stage exam, where in the first stage the, of an exam, and I had multiple ones during the semester, students would take the exam themselves, and in the second stage, they'd work through it with a group, um, either the whole exam or a subset. Um, because that class only met for 50 minutes, I actually did it on two days. The first day, um, they take the exam individually, and then I would grade it, and then I would give them, you know, if there were some questions that everyone got right, tended not to happen, but if there were some questions that everyone got correct, I wouldn't put that on the second stage. But typically, I give them the same exam the second time before giving it back to them, and then I'd have them work in their group on it and submit a joint copy of that and then the grade would their individual grades was a weighted average of the individual and the group grade because what I did prior to that is I'd give them the exam in one class I would grade it then I'd return it to the next class and what would happen is I go through the exam and go over all the questions asking them along the way but the students who did well who got a b plus or an a generally just kind of sat there smiling and not really learning all that much the students who did poorly would normally get really discouraged and would be likely not to pay any attention at all. But when they do the second stage as a group, what happens is um, they'll, you know, I, I, the first time I did this, I actually took a quick video recording and sent it to Rebecca, who was the associate director at the time, um, because I had talked about doing this in class. And it was such a different atmosphere because the students were going through questions and saying things like, 
I don't remember doing this before. And then someone else would say, well, remember when we worked on that problem, you know, and they describe the problem and, and the other person would say, oh yeah, I didn't make that connection. But that peer instruction combined with that group activity can really help students see that if they're not understanding something and other people are that maybe they need to put a little bit more effort into it you know you can always combine grading schemes that are a mix of individual and um and group and with the you know a common thing with the two-stage exams is perhaps to some people weigh them 50 50 other people would put two-thirds or three-quarters of the weight on the individual and the remaining part on the rest but it was so much more efficient and students came out learning it much more deeply that when we went on to the next stuff, when they had their classmates explaining to them on the topics they were getting stuck on, it, it made so much more difference than if I was to explain to the whole class what the correct answer was and why some of the other approaches were wrong, because they're getting individual feedback from other students they've been working with. I don't know if that helps, but, you know, and what I did to avoid that problem of friends working together is when I mention the idea of them working in persistent groups for a semester, normally they say, well, can we select our groups? And I'll say, well, how do you get to form? How do you know these other people in class? And they'll say, well, we've taken a lot of classes together. I said, well, would that create a very balanced group if all the people who've taken a lot of math or a lot of economics classes together are all in the same group and the people who've only had a few classes in this topic are all left to themselves to work in their separate groups? And then generally they recognize that. And so what I normally would do in the case of econometrics or the seminar course is I'd ask them how many math courses or statistics courses they had taken before that class. And they enter a Google form, you know, and I'll have a, I'll sort it from highest to lowest. And then I'll just go through and I'll spread out the people who had the most math classes, then the students who have the next most one all the way down. And that way, each group would be a mix of some students who had more extensive background in the subject and others who have less. So it automatically made the groups a little bit more balanced. And it it separated out the groups of friends from the people who were not friends with other students. And it, it led to a much more positive environment because when, when I've tried using groups and let students pick their own groups, the conversations would often be about things they were planning for that weekend or other things and would be off topic. But when the groups were created just for the purpose of working through problems in the class, it changed the focus a little bit because they're no longer just a group of friends getting together. They're now a group of people who were chosen to work through the problems. And it seemed to lead to much more productive work on those things. Now, you know, there are some students who'll disappear and, you know, you, you work that out as it goes, but, um, and normally what would happen is if there were group problem sets, a more typical thing is, you know, some, someone might disagree with the group solutions and I'd let them turn in individual, you know, recusals on particular questions. So they could turn in their own responses if they didn't like what the group did. Normally they go along with it. Um, but I remember one time in a second stage exam, um, one student did extremely well in the first version and they let other people persuade him on the, the group version. Um, and, you know, it would actually have lowered his grade. I said, well, you should have been stronger i actually ended up letting his keep keep his him keep his original score but said i'll do it just this one time from now on if you're sure you're right either you know defect from the group on this question <laughs> or make a strong case to the rest of the group so um it doesn't always work you know but um one thing and this is something that kristen Prail had talked about in a workshop a couple of years ago that i've been doing whenever i form groups is especially if they're working on persistent groups on a project. In some cases, I've had them write books together. In other cases, create series of podcasts and things uh, in the capstone course. Um, is just to allow some class time for group processing. You know, to at the beginning of the group, have them come up with a group charter where they decide on the rules for engagement, how to make sure that everyone does their share and so forth. And then periodically, every few weeks, just have them talk about what's working well and what's not working well to air any problems they have. And it, it's reduced the number of issues where I've had to step in for this, you know, in those cases where students just disappeared. Because if they make a binding commitment to the, their classmates, it's much more positive than, you know, if they're just in a group and they don't, no, they haven't created that sort of commitment to it. That's not quite what you were asking, but does that help at all? Maybe? 
Groups don't always work well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, and I think that like there's only so much you can control when you're talking about activities outside of the classroom, right? And um, it's just, you know, when you're, I, th I think, um, you know, when you're in the classroom setting that expectation right at the beginning and always revisiting it, because I've also been in the situation where I'm like, all right, everyone, let's get in groups. And, you know, the groups end up being very wishy-washy throughout the uh, semester. But then, you know, when I, I, started a couple of years ago having um, um, certain roles and responsibilities for, for the uh, discussion groups. And so every person, and I you know printed little cards and I would hand them out to the group so that they knew what the responsibilities for each role was in the group. And um, over time, that really, I didn't have to, you know, remind them of, you know, those responsibilities and those roles in the discussion groups. They then you know, we're able to say, oh yeah, we've been doing this, you know, groups of four, here are the four roles. I'm going to take this one this time. And, you know, so it, it really, I, I think setting the expe expectation and sticking with it right at the beginning will, you know, kind of create that culture um, as you move forward. And one technique I picked up actually from Jessica Kruger at uh, um, Buffalo was when I had students work in groups on those projects I mentioned, the book projects where they were each group was working on a different chapter or where they were working on podcasts, mm -hmm. is I had them all work together in a Google Doc where they'd allocate the tasks somewhat within their chapters, but I just asked them to code their own, their contributions with their own colors. I mean, you could always look at the edit history of a Google Doc to see who was actually doing most of the writing. Mm -hmm. But if it's, if it's all color coded, it makes it so much easier to visually see. And obvious if, to them. Yeah, and, and obvious to each other how much each of them contributed. Uh, and it made it so much easier to give separate feedback. However you do it, you wanna provide individual accountability because otherwise you run into that incentive problem, you know, where someone will coast and let other people do all the work. So, you know, we don't want that sort of collective uh, effort problem to appear. Okay, so um, moving on, um, well, same types of things. Another thing you can do is do role-playing activities. And there's a whole host of those you can do in terms of active learning. There's the Reacting to the Past series, which are available online. Um, they do workshops. I forgot where it was. Um, there's a school where they were all developed and they do periodic workshops there. But there are all these um, reacting to the best activities in most academic disciplines that you can adopt that run from you know, a portion of a class up to a whole semester's worth of activities, um, which can be interesting. You could have students do debates where they, they each play the role of a different party or a different, a different group in a yeah. particular debate. Um, yeah, I'm actually gonna do, you know, a, a sort of debate in my class this uh, this upcoming semester. It's uh, both classes on the death penalty and we're gonna talk about mitigating and aggregate, aggravating factors and uh, the role that um, prosecutors and defense attorneys, you know, have to um, present that information to a jury. And so they're gonna uh, take part in uh, making the arguments in a, in a case on um, these kind of, factors. So there is going to be kind of a debate. I've also done um, mock trials in my class as well, um, you know, related to courts. And so there's, there's really a lot that you can, um, you know, think on in, in any class. We had someone going back in terms of role playing, someone did a reacting to the past in an um, astronomy class about whether Pluto should be a planet. And that went on for several weeks where they met at night and, and debated that in different roles. Yeah. Um, debates we mentioned. There's also a variety of game activities you can do where mm -hmm. students are, it could be gamification or it could be other learning games and so forth. Um, I mentioned two stage exams already. And we, yeah, we've, we've sort of touched on the collaborative um, projects. We talked a little bit about project-based learning. I don't know, John, did you have something to say? Well, one other thing with, with project-based learning is you can come up with projects where there's some intrinsic value, where there's a form of authentic learning, where students can see the value of what they're doing and they can recognize how it's going to make a difference somewhere. So, you know, when appropriate, community-based learning projects can be really, really effective and really memorable. Open pedagogy projects. I mentioned that a little bit in terms of things I've been doing. Basically what happens there is students are actively creating educational content rather than just serving as consumers. 
And that could be creating video series. A lot of faculty have students create, if they're in a college, in an intro college course, they might create a series of videos, instructional videos to share with high school students, for example, learning that material. Um, or they could you know, create videos dealing with applications of those concepts. They could be text, they could be textbooks, they could be blogs, they could be web pages and so forth. They could be audio files, they could be podcasts, podcasts for example. Um, and I, I use student presentations in almost all of my classes, um, at least every one I can think of in the, you know, um, in the past, um, you know, several years. Um, but giving, um, you know, especially when you have courses that are uh, looking to develop oral communication among your students, um, having presentations gives them the opportunity to facilitate discussion, um, to um, depending on you know what your what your goals are, it could give them the opportunity to explore concepts related to your course that um, they wanted to take a deeper dive into. Um, you can even have these as group presentations. Um, I know a lot of faculty have um, created poster sessions. We have um, um, Quest coming up. I know a lot of faculty on also campus, yes. on our campus, sorry, um, which is a, an opportunity for students to showcase their undergraduate research. And so a lot of faculty I've, um, I, I know try to coincide their spring projects with Quest so that their students are creating posters or creating a panel session on um, a particular topic. And I know that those have uh, gone pretty well in, in the faculty that have engaged in, in those projects. So there's there's really a lot I think you can um, you can explore here. And one thing I've done is I started, I, in my econometrics class for decades, I had students do research projects and present them. But what I've changed to in the last four or five years is poster sessions, where instead of just standing up in front of the class with a PowerPoint, where most of the class is sitting there anxiously waiting to have to get through their own presentation and not really paying that much attention to what other students are doing, by breaking it up into a couple of days of poster sessions, students create a poster and then instead of presenting for five minutes or seven minutes or 10 minutes to the whole class, they get to explain what they were doing for an entire or nearly an entire class period to everyone else in the class. So it gives them actually much more practice presentation and they get to do the same sort of presentation over and over again to different clusters of other people who've come through. And when I do that, I invite members of my department. We've had a dean come by a couple of times to actually talk to students or to view their student presentations. And, and they find that much more enjoyable than doing still another PowerPoint presentation. Now, having said that, in my capstone course, in addition to working on this big project, I also have students who, it's actually the first day of class, they create the syllabus. They pick the topics we're going to be covering. There's certain things we have to do that are part of the learning objectives for the class, but you know, it's, it's pulling together all the things they've learned. In theory, it's pulling together all the things they've learned throughout the major, and they get to pick the range of topics of applications they're going to work with. And every year they come up with some different topics. Um, and each week they pick the topics, but I pick the readings that they're going to do. And they present research papers and studies and working papers and so forth every week. And, um, and we also have them discuss that using hypothesis in between so that they all come in prepared to have an active discussion. And that's worked really well. Um, and again, where they get to pick the topics, they have so much more buy-in than it. if I came up with a, a list of topics. Now, in many classes, you don't have that sort of flexibility, but you know, I get to have them address all the things I want them to see, but they can pick what the specific areas are. So some years they might look at the economics of education. They might look at income inequality. They might look at, um, at financial crises. They might look at um, economic history. They might look at the economics of climate change or other factors. Um, and they're still using the same tools, but on just different focal points. But when they get some say over it, when they have some, um, when they get some, decision in terms of what the topics are in the class, they have so much more engagement and so much more buy-in. And the poster sessions have just worked really well as well too. Now, that's all we really have prepared here, except we also shared some resources. And I would encourage you to, if you have a smartphone handy, just to, I'm gonna hop 
over here for just a second uh, and put this in the chat because since you're on Zoom, it's a little bit easier. Uh, when people were, when this, when I first put this together, more people were in person. Uh, we don't have quite as many people here in person as, as we did in the past because our campus has um, the heat turned off in most academic buildings and there's no food services on campus as we discovered when we came here for the first day of <laughs> workshops uh, and left a little bit hungrier than we yeah. came. Uh, but in any case, we'll hop to this in a minute, but um, if you use your smartphone and grab that, you can also then bookmark it. There's some really, really good resources in here that I, I'd like to at least highlight a few of those as we go through. So does everyone have that? We're half the link. Hearing no no's, we'll, we'll just hop over there. Um, and let's take a look. There's many, many resources out there, but here are some really useful ones. The first ones are basically just some of the better known research studies on active learning. And it looks like most people have it. Um, there's some really good studies out there. Now, there was one that came out about two months ago, which it claims to cast some doubt on active learning, but basically it's someone who's a theoretical purist who critiqued pretty much every study that's been done. And there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies on the grounds that they don't have complete measures that are perfect on every way in terms of randomized controlled trials and so forth. But in general, I've never seen a study that suggests that active learning is less effective than lecture um, or than more passive techniques. So I didn't even include a link to that. I wasn't terribly impressed by it, but it has gotten a lot of attention in the Chronicle and various other areas, mostly from people who are very much tied to lecture, who don't want to consider the possibility of anything else. But there's a lot of studies are about what the research shows about this. But one thing I would really suggest, all these have some really great resources, but one I'd really like to emphasize is the Cape Patricia Cross Academy, which was put together by a couple of people who've been really active. Cape Patricia Cross, by the way, uh, just died this past year. But this was put together by Claire Major and Claire Majors, who's at Kentucky, I think, and um, and I forgot who the other person is, this other person, whoever she is. But it's it's a wonderful set of resources that I would suggest you bookmark or keep it in this document, where they have a techniques library, a video library with a lot of short videos as well as resources on some really effective evidence-based research um, or evidence-based active learning techniques. There's a digital story, the three to one approach where you ask students to write three things they learned in the class, two things they found interesting, and one question they still have. It's sort of very much like an exit ticket, but it's one which, again, it just adds a little variety to it. Uh, there's a contemporary issue journals um, where you can find things related to coursework, the jigsaw technique, group grids, analytic teams. And one of the nice things is that about Two, well, back in 2020 to 2021, um, the two creators of this site, both of whom have done some really, really wonderful work in terms of teaching and learning. Originally, it was for face-to-face -face instruction, but now they've added online activities for each of these activities as well. So you can find it. We'll pick one in just a minute just to go through. But there's a lot of research techniques here. Paper seminars, Team Jeopardy, the three-minute message, uh, quick writes, active reading docu documents. And this is just the first of many, many pages. So, um, so let's pick one. Anyone have a choice? Jigsaw. Jigsaw, okay. Um, so the jigsaw technique. And what you'll find there is a short video. Most of them are only three to 10 minutes, but then they also have with one of the two creators of the site uh, describing the technique and how to use it. Then there's an instructor's guide, which talks about how to implement it in class. For many of them, they'll have templates or forms you can use to share and instructions you can share. So we'll, we'll just take a quick look at the instructor's guide. Here's all the materials. You can click on that. It's all free. Um, and Let's just pop that up for a second. It should pop up. I thought it popped up. Let me try that again. Uh, one more time. Oh, it's a zip file. So there's a whole series of resources here. So you have to extract it. So let me. Um,
Let me find that. Okay, so um, let me just pop this over. And it, it disappeared on the way. One more time. It's not dragging. Oh no, not again. Um, well, let me try opening up some of the individual documents. Here, I can share um, my screen um, because I am on here. Well, I, I got it now. Um, or I thought I did. Actually, yeah, if you want to share your screen, this this computer has been acting up periodically. So let me um, make sure I have. <laughs> so let me um, stop the share. There we go. All right, we're in the jigsaw. So it'll create a zip file and then you yeah. just unzip them. And there's just a couple documents in there. Everyone see it? Please. I might have already uh, downloaded a separate one because I, I jumped into the group grid because I was like, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> so um, here we are. Am I there? Is it on? So they're HTML documents. Um, they were obviously created on the Mac. Um, and oh, well, that's a group one. Okay, yeah. So that's the jigsaw, right? Yeah, I'm going into the jigsaw one. So extract it, or just um, I thought I did. Okay, you got it. Yep. I guess right. I just do this one. Yep. There we go. Okay, so there's an instructor's guide to doing jigsaw activities. Activity type, teaching problems addressed. Yeah, and for each of them, by the way, they use that classification, the activity type, and it's searchable by activity type, the That's teaching nice. problem addressed, and the, the taxonomy uh, in terms of what types of things yeah. are done. I like that because if you're having a problem, you could be like, how do I, let and me it, look at all the techniques. And that it's will searchable by that. So you yeah. can do that from the drop downs. Okay, so. It's Claire Majors and Elizabeth Barkley is the other person who created all these. Wow, that's really nice. And they do really great work on these. This is really nice. And then again, they've got those step-to-step -step techniques. And in many cases, they'll have templates and forms you can use where you just edit them for your specific applications. And they have variations and extensions on many of them if you wanna mix it up a little bit. Online. And then they have the online adaptations for all these activities now. Asynchronously or synchronously. And here's technique template. Nice. In terms of active learning, this website I think is probably one of the best that I've seen out there in terms of the variety of activities, oh. the detailed instructions they provide, and the, um, the examples. Um, there you go. Maggie is doing that. I'm typing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's it's a really nice set of resources. So if we could go back up to the next, maybe the sure the other back to the document or mm -hmm. let's see what this one is. Um I feel like these are probably the same, but that's it. Okay. Yeah, yeah we could go back to that document. Um the activity the one we put together oh well actually oh yeah actually let's go back right to the cross academy first oh, okay okay um yeah so go back up and by the way they now have a book which is one of the best books i've seen on it um and the book they're not making any profits on themselves they're using that to support the the engaged teaching book it's wonderful oh, for every activity they have um it's 30 dollars it, and it has all these activities in more detail and more applications right. and so forth. It's, um, 
we actually, uh, Claire Howell was on, on my podcast, uh, actually three or four times, but one of those was talking about this book and it's, it is a bestseller. It's doing really well. It's, it's still $29.99 because they only released it last year. Um, Amazing. But um, I might have just put it in my. Amazon but they're card. using any any um, royalties they get to it to pay for the hosting of the site as well as for you know any ancillary costs because they just did this as a volunteer because um, Kate Patricia Cross was was influential for each of them they each had co-authored with her and then she was ill and they put this together kind of to recognize all of her contributions. And it's, it's really, really useful. Uh, and again, if you do a search on that, um, either in the, the oh, bar sure. at the top, or you could, oh, I'm trying to remember what the cross kind of currents library is. That's another new Filter feature. Filter techniques. Bye. There you go. Teaching so you, problem addressed. Let's do that. Yeah. So if you select that, then you get a list of many different teaching problems you may have. And then you could find all the activities that somehow address that. I know we're all dealing. Co motivation yes. and engagement are probably among the more popular ones. This is cool. If only I um, saw some of these things a couple of weeks ago, I might have put them in my class this semester. <laughs> but or maybe in, I'll be spending the next week incorporating all of these into my class. It's a great resource. Yeah. And the book is the book is based on this, actually. It's just elaborating on all these things in more detail. Yeah. Everything you need is really on the website and is available for free. You know, but if you prefer reading in a book, you could do it because then you got the index and you can jump back and forth. Yeah. But again, the search tools on this are really, really, really nice. good. Yeah. And they've done a really nice job of putting it together and they keep expanding it all the time. And again, in 2021 to 20, 2020 to 2021, they doubled the techniques by adding the online one, uh, the online versions of all of mm -hmm. these. And if we go back to the resource guide, there's a couple of others I want to highlight. Um, another great, a good book, if you want just a single book, is that one that is currently has a cursor on it, which is Claire Major, the same Claire Major, Tatsa Kryzik, and Mark Harris, I think it's Mark Harris. Um, it says 101 intentional designed activities. This is actually the second edition of it. The first edition was 101 activities, but again, they doubled the number of activities to add online variants of each of the activities. So it's really 202 <laughs> intentionally designed educational activities to put students on the path to success. Actually, there's a few more than that. But, um, but again, that describes even more activities than you might find in the other. Um, the reaction to the past we mentioned before, if you really want an encyclopedic view of teaching at its best, on what research tells you about research, uh, it was Linda Nielsen's books for the first four iterations, but she's now getting tired of doing updates on it. She's also got two or three other books. Those of you who've taken AQ have seen Linda Nielsen quite a bit. She now has, she's retired. She still gives like 40 or 50 keynotes every year, but she's now actually working with animals in a pet shelter, in an animal shelter, and she didn't want to do all the updates, so she brought in Todd Zakrizek, and they worked on this edition, which just came out this past fall, <laughs> but it's pretty much an encyclopedia of what research tells us is effective in instruction, all modalities. So it's, it's a really, really good book. Now, if we scroll down to podcasts, mm -hmm. a few that I recommend is if you want to hear a brief summary of that book, listen to Linda Nielsen and Todd Surprise it on its podcast. That was actually last spring. It was last February. Um, Clara talked about the website on the one right below it. Um, and the Teaching for Learning one was that other book that Michael Harris, yeah, it was Michael. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really good. Dakin Burdick actually has been active with POD for several decades. He was working at um, with the SUNY CPD for a few years at a satellite center they had at Portland before he moved on to some other things. Now, one thing, though, that we should mention before we leave this topic is that active learning leads to, in pretty much in every study I've seen, leads to more learning than passive activities and passive lecture. However, what happens is that students tend to resist active learning. 
that when students are asked which they find to be more effective in terms of learning, lecture or active learning activities, students will almost universally claim that they feel they learn more in a lecture-based class. This was a study that was done at Harvard, I believe. Um, yeah, Harvard, where they looked at students in STEM classes and they measured the extent to which classes were active learning or were lecture-based classes. And the students in lecture classes felt they learned more than in classes where they had active learning activities. However, <clears throat> when the actual learning was measured in terms of student outcomes on standard, standardized measures, students learned significantly more in active learning classes than in lecture-based classes, but they thought they learned less and they thought they were less useful. So the main point is, if you use more active learning techniques, students are going to argue that you're no longer teaching them, or some students will argue that you're not teaching them, that they have to learn the material themselves, as if we could somehow learn it for them. <laughs> but we have to be really careful in preparing students for this, especially if you don't have tenure. Um, because if you're coming up for tenure, this using more active learning techniques has a really good chance of interfering with your, um, your has a really good chance of interfering with your course evaluations. Um, because again, unless you sell it to the students really effectively, let them know what you're doing, why you're doing, and something about the evidence that's available on all these things. So, and that's a really nice study that kind of emphasizes that point. And anything? That, I'm, I I don't have anything else, but does anyone have questions? Yeah, any questions or, or comments? Maybe we could stop the share. Yeah, I'll stop the share here. Any thoughts on any of this? There's a lot of material, so. Let's see, Doris um, has written, I once had a student write in a course evaluation that I only taught from the book and they didn't really learn anything. It was class that was all, and did not have a book assigned. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> Classic. That that that's an extreme variant of that, but we yeah. we all get. I'll, I'll, I'll share. Uh, this is Tom. Yeah, re recently I've been using more and more active learning, and 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 receiving more frequent comments of the type you speak. Yeah, he's not teaching us. Right. And, we have to and, do all the work, and, and, <laughs> as if somehow we could do the learning for them. But you know, for me, I've been teaching for more years than I care to admit. It's the easiest thing for me to do is lecture, straight lecture. For my for the material I've talked about all my life, various management and courses, uh, I can just give me a topic and I can just start going, you know? So it's more difficult for me to set up, I think, good active learning uh, experiences. So I work harder at doing that. And so it does kind of, it's yeah. disappointing when I, when I get those kind of comments, but that's the way the world is. But I, want, I do want to share with you one collaborative uh, team-oriented project I use for the kind of courses I teach, principles and management, nonprofit, motivation, leadership, organizational behavior. They all lend themselves so easily to this. So one of, often a final project in the courses such as these, face-to-face -face or online, is because we've tried a lot of application-oriented activities during the semester. Cases are one of them. I have them in teams of three to four develop a case of their own. And I really tell them how to do it. Take four or five topics, different topics that we've talked about, say in leadership over the course of the semester, different theories or motivation, whatever. And, and think of you know ones that you really know that believe you know well. And then, and then uh, t hypothetically develop a few questions you could ask, then create your case. In other words, create a case. I said it only has to be a half a page, three quarters of a page, six, single space typed, so that it provides enough information that you can ask these four or five questions. And I want you to, to so develop your case, ask the questions separately, answer them, but I want you to uh, share it with the class uh, in a very informal type of, I, would, I, hate, I hate to even call it a presentation, but share it with the class and, and, and do some teaching of your own. Ask them, 
give them the case, ask them the question, and see see what they do. So that that seems to go over pretty well. They, they, and I asked for creativity if they if they would like to make it creative. I get some re some really good ones. I had one team. I can't believe they put this much effort into it. Their entire management case they wrote as a poem, using cartoon using characters from <laughs> Disney and all that. It was incredible, incredible. It got the interest of the class, that's for sure. Yeah, having students teach concepts is a really effective way of encouraging them to learn those concepts. There was a question from Josh about whether in-class debates get heated with controversy. They certainly can, depending on the class, not so much in econometrics, perhaps, as in some other classes. But you know, in general, one good way of addressing that is having, having the class come up with ways of addressing challenging topics and so forth, and how to deal with conflicts where people have heated opinions. And if they can come up with class policies on that and they all buy into it, that can tend to reduce that. I haven't seen that so much. I saw it more five or six years ago. I haven't seen that same level of engagement since the pandemic, actually. It would be nice to see more students getting heated about concepts. <laughs> um, but but in general, the best strategy tends to be to discussing those things up front and address how individuals can deal with conflicts when they do strongly disagree with other people and coming up with rules. And we, we actually did a reading group on that a, a couple of years ago. Um, you know, but be prepared for that and try to address those things in advance can be helpful. Um, and yeah, the death penalty debate might be. Um, yeah. We get a little more as, heated as in my classes. As, as long as it's not a practicum, you know. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and Abby noted that having with active learning, there's often more work on the front end, but less on the back. And the students do come along, but it is a shift. They're not used to this. For most of their educational experiences, they've been lectured at, or you know, they've worked on problem sets, perhaps. But um, but when you're doing something different, you do have to prepare students, let them know why they're doing it. You know, use a tilt approach of transparency and learning and teaching, and just make sure that everyone, under, and uh, done by Marianne Winkleman, um, she's got some great resources on that. But the main point is you make it clear to students what the objectives are, why you're doing this, and why you're doing this the way that you are, and how it may be beneficial for them to have those experiences. And sometimes just tying it to things they may have to do later in their careers, you know, that they will be making presentations. They will not have someone there teaching them all the time when they need to learn new skills. And, you know, being proactive and trying to learn things on their own is actually a really useful thing to learn while they're in college. So other, any other thoughts or suggestions on effective active learning activity? There's so many. I mean, we could, we could spend weeks on this. One thing we kind of gloss over in that list of resources was the active learning initiative at Cornell. A few years ago, Cornell invested a couple million dollars actually in introducing active learning activities in many of the areas where they had high DFW rates. And what they did basically is they trained graduate students in active learning techniques and they had them work with faculty in order to build in more active learning activities into their classes. and. Um, and they've been doing quite a bit of research on it. And they found, again, as we've talked about earlier, that they tend to benefit all students in terms of reducing DFW rates, but the gains are largest for students who are at greater risk of being unsuccessful. So it's a really good way of reducing equity gaps. Any other things? The most useful thing I think is that document we shared. And again, I would most strongly recommend the K Pacific, uh, K Pacific Cross Academy resources. It, it's wonderful. Hearing the description of it from someone who does it and the resources they provide from their own implementations of it is a really good way of getting started on active learning techniques, especially if you've never mm -hmm. tried some of them before. And there are so many there. I don't know of anyone other than Claire and perhaps um, Elizabeth, who actually have used all of them. So. Okay, well, well thank, you, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to thank you. Um, and that was uh, a very good uh, seminar, thanks. thanks. Thank you so much. This was very helpful all week. And I hope they'll have time next week to see you all.
Yeah. We've got lots of, we've got slightly <laughs> less than half, but we still have, I think, about 40 or so workshops coming yeah. up next week. So it's amazing. I I am struggling to get I think four or five workshops organized for January. Um so I am very <laughs> What's you know, that? The, first, the first year I was doing this, I think we had like 20 or so uh, from carrying over from the previous director. And then it just keeps expanding every year. And we get more and more people presenting and more and more people attending. And the pandemic just it skyrocketed. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. All right. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take okay. Care. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Get some rest and, and come join us as often as you want. All right. Thank you.